Okay, so in the previous episode, we talked about slums. We talked about high-rise public housing. We talked about the process of slum clearance and its victims. Uh, we talked about how housing funding was used to construct everything except public housing. And we talked about a few early successful models for public housing, including Red Vienna and Greenbelt, Maryland. And I mentioned capital of whores, public control, where profit can be made. And that'll be today's story. So let's look at how public housing has changed since the first great build-outs. Uh, we're going to talk about the Section 8 program, the HOPE 6 program, and some ways public or at least social housing, has been built through alternative power structures throughout history and even in recent years to a certain extent. So we'll start by talking about the modern Section 8 program. So President Nixon put a moratorium on new public housing construction uh, in 1973, and instead we got the Section 8 program. So Section 8 is a direct federal subsidy to landlords. Uh, the Section 8, or Housing Choice Voucher, works like this. You, the Section 8 voucher receiver, can rent a private residential unit in any building with the Section 8 friendly landlord. You're expected to pay 30% of your income in rent, with the remainder made up by the local housing authority. Section 8 landlords are required to charge no more than what the government calls fair market rent. And that's usually well below actual market rent. Now, since there are a lot of Section 8 tenants to choose from, and uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development is fairly prompt with the checks, it's easy and steady money for landlords. Uh, today, Section 8 is by far the largest housing assistance program in the United States, we spent about $32 billion on the Section 8 program in 2017 as compared to $6.3 billion on traditional public housing in that same year. Now keep in mind, that's a $32 billion direct subsidy to landlords. Uh, needy folks don't see a dime of that. However, uh, much like public housing units, the demand for Section 8 vouchers far outstrips the supply. In 2011, for instance, the Oakland, California Public Housing Authority received 100,000 Section 8 applicants in its five-day application period. Through a lottery, 10,000 of them actually made it on the waiting list, which was six years long at that point. Now, most Section 8 waiting lists are just outright closed, uh, including New York, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia... Boston, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, Seattle, Wilmington, Chicago, Milwaukee, Miami, Orlando, Minneapolis, Atlanta, New Orleans, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Indianapolis, South Bend, and Detroit. So, back in 1974, right, uh, Nixon gets impeached, uh, and the public housing moratorium is lifted. Shortly thereafter, the Housing Act of 1974 is passed, and with it we get Community Development Block Grants. We're not going to talk too much about them, but these are basically block grants which were awarded for various purposes other than housing. So, you know, you could fix up a commercial corridor or improve public infrastructure or use it for economic development. There's some level of community control over where the funding goes, but of course, that can be co-opted by private interests, right? And uh, this overall is what we see after 1974. We see increased private involvement in the administration of public housing and subsidized housing programs. So private developers build brand new Section 8 developments in blighted areas. Uh, some of these private developers are nonprofits, and many more of them are not. Uh, previously, unrentable spaces are brought up to Section 8 standards and rented. You know, this is part of that greater trend of uh, neoliberalism, right? Market-based solutions executed through private entities 
are sought for uh, the problems which were previously thought to be the government's domain. As a result, private individuals uh, are allowed to profit off of social welfare programs. I'm talking about the landlords there. Now, furthermore, housing authorities began to sort of shy away from new construction public housing projects. Uh, a thing called scattered sites projects become more popular, right? Housing authorities just buy existing housing stock and run it as public housing. Now, this is not a bad solution by any means, right? Since in a lot of urban areas, the vernacular housing stock is all very similar, and there are a lot of contractors capable of doing repairs. Uh, but in some cases, of course, housing authorities buy the housing and then just sit on it. You know, they put off renovations for years and let it fall into disrepair. The Tax Reform Act of 1986 is passed introducing the low income housing tax credit okay right so I'm a socialist and I'm sure so is a lot of my audience and we talk about ridiculous caricatures of inscrutable neoliberal policy a lot like I don't know some kind of cap and trade means tested refundable tax credit on fuel distributors with exemptions for domestic oil dealers to combat climate change or something you know and and the truth is that a lot of neoliberal policies aren't too hard to understand and are pretty reasonable if you agree with the underlying logic behind them which is that capitalism just needs tweaks to work properly which, you know, obviously socialists disagree with, right? Because uh, we think that capitalism is fundamentally broken and unreformable and must be replaced. Okay. The low-income housing tax credit is actually that ridiculous caricature of neoliberal policy. It's complicated and inscrutable, relies on strange financing and means testing and complex formulas and half a dozen middlemen to function. So, for the sake of minimizing harm to viewers, please enjoy the soothing footage of the Korean People's Army while I explain how it works. So, the low income housing tax credit is, of course, a tax credit. Uh, the person who receives the tax credits has their taxes reduced dollar for dollar. Now, a tax credit differs from a tax deduction. A tax deduction decreases your taxable income, so your actual tax burden is reduced by some percentage of the deduction, right? Okay. So these tax credits are set at a fixed dollar value by Congress. They're distributed according to some formula to the several states, generally a per capita amount or a fixed amount, whichever is higher. These credits are then awarded via a competitive bidding process to developers who seek to build low-income housing that meets the requirements of the low-income housing tax credit. Now there's three criteria that qualify development for the low-income housing tax credit. Number one, at least 20% of the project's units are occupied by tenants with an income of 50% or less of area median income adjusted for family size, that's AMI. Uh, two, at least 40% of the units are occupied by tenants with an income of 60% or less of AMI. Three, at least 40% of the units are occupied by tenants with an income averaging no more than 60% of AMI, and no units are occupied by tenants with an income greater than 80% of AMI. Simple, right? Now this gets more complicated though. Okay, so generally the developer isn't paying enough corporate tax to really make full use of the tax credit awarded. You know, construction has thin profit margins, right? So, after being awarded the tax credit, the developer then turns around and sells the tax credit to a bank or group of investors for a large fraction of its full value. The proceeds from the sale, plus additional financing, are used to fund the construction. The tax credit can also be transferred through a partnership between the developer and a bank or a group of investors, 
or used in many other ways which are very complicated and I don't want to talk about them too much. So the net effect of this is that a whole bunch of folks have taken their piece of the tax credit pie before construction even begins. I explain this in just about the most simplistic way possible. There are some far more complicated financing mechanisms that can be employed here which further reduce the value of the tax credit and uh, instead bleed off money into the pockets of middlemen. Um, there's a fixed 15 year compliance period during which the housing must remain affordable for the uh, tax credit to be valid. After the compliance period is done, there's no restriction on raising the rent, though some places raise the requirement to 30 years and not 15 years. Uh, plus, the rents available to folks making 50% or less of area median income can still be quite high. Uh, in parts of, say, the Bay Area, your tenants could be making sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year and your development would still qualify for the low income housing tax credit so if you're thinking well that just sounds like a subsidy with extra steps you're right they just turn it around backwards and inside out so you sell your future tax credits to receive an advance from someone else who now won't have to pay the taxes the government is spending the same amount of money as if it were a direct subsidy now Despite all this, the low-income housing tax credit basically works, and it's funded about 90% of new construction and rehabbed affordable housing in the United States since it was implemented. However, it's incredibly inefficient, and frankly, we'd be better off just handing big sacks of cash with dollar signs on them to uh, developers rather than this complex tax credit system. And, of course the low-income housing tax credit works better when corporate taxes are high and uh, well guess what the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 did it lowered the corporate tax rate so around the same time the low-income housing tax credit was introduced the Reagan administration decided to increase the proportion of section 8 individuals income to contribute on rent and that's about the only change in actual publicly subsidized housing legislature until a program called Hope 6 came around. Okay, so, there were plenty of traditional public housing developments which were in terrible shape by 1992, right? Where the only option which seemed realistic to housing authorities were mass evictions, demolitions, and reconstructions. Uh, the residents usually felt otherwise, but, you know, they weren't in charge of their own housing. So, Hope 6, or Housing Opportunities for People Everywhere, but formerly known as the Revitalization of Severely Distressed Public Housing Program, is a federal grant program for demolishing distressed or blighted public housing projects and replacing them with mixed-income housing. That is... Uh, housing for folks making between 30% and 80% of area median income. So the idea is that you reduce concentrated poverty or, you know, you, you stop the poor people from living close to other poor people and that prevents them from doing crime or whatever. Um, Hope 6 projects are usually, but not always, built according to the principles of something called new urbanism. Uh, you know, if you're a progressive person, or traditional neighborhood design, if you're a conservative person, they're, they're, they're the same thing. You build apartments over shops and build denser housing where you can uh, walk uh, to uh, run your errands and maybe walk to work, there's public transportation. You, there's more to it than that, but that's outside the scope of this episode. So some Hope 6 funded projects also get funding from the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, which converts public housing directly into Section 8 housing, no construction required, and that housing may or may not then be operated by a private entity. So Hope 6 began in 1992, but wasn't fully authorized by Congress until 1999, uh, removing a crucial requirement for the program in the process which was a one-for-one -one replacement of existing subsidized units for new subsidized units in Hope 6 funded new construction. And uh, for, for the purposes of this video, a subsidized unit is either a Section 8 or public housing unit, right? Okay. 
So, in 1999, the Housing and Urban Development Secretary, who was some guy named Andrew Cuomo, released a report stating that of 87,000 folks in subsidized housing surveyed, 80% thought their housing was in good or better condition. Furthermore, 85% of housing authorities passed inspection with regard to the condition of residential units. The blighted housing towers which Hope 6 intended to renovate and improve were a minority of units. Uh, the majority of units were garden apartments and single-family homes, which were in fair to good condition. Hope 6 was only intended to demolish and replace severely distressed units and projects, right? Okay, so here's the catch. There was no real qualification for what severely distressed was. And now you didn't need to replace the subsidized units one for one with new subsidized units. You could build mixed income projects. And plenty of successful housing projects were on fairly valuable land. Are you seeing where this is going? So we're back at the 52nd Street public housing project. So as the neighborhood gentrifies around it, the land underneath the housing project becomes more valuable. Folks, even well-intentioned ones, who are working at the housing authority begin to take notice. Now, there's nothing particularly wrong with this project. You know, it's in fair condition, but it is expensive to run, and crucially, it fits the bill for the sort of housing project Hope 6 is meant to revitalize, right? So we say capital has agency, right? The logic of the market dictates that the capitalists must do everything in their power to keep costs down and profits up, lest another capitalist outcompete them. Even, you know, a person who is by nature extremely generous and good-natured, when put in the position of the capitalist, becomes greedy and nasty, lest they be outcompeted by someone greedier and nastier. Right? The capitalist system entraps the capitalist as much as the worker. So, public authorities, in theory, can work against it, but are frequently entrapped in the same cruel logic, right? The folks in charge of the housing authority realize that by doing away with the 52nd Street project and redeveloping it as a mixed income public private partnership, they can reduce their operating costs and give their budget some breathing room. So, a wealthy developer in the area named uh, Realty Partners for Progress, headquartered at 1209 North Orange Street, Wilmington, Delaware, pulls some strings and a Hope 6 grant is awarded for the redevelopment of the 52nd Street project. So, beautiful renders of a modern mixed-use neighborhood are drawn up. There's a park, there's a bunch of plants, uh, you know, and they're presented to the community, uh, and the community, of course, probably won't end up living there. We'll get to that in a second. So, of course, what everyone really notices, though, is that the entourage, uh, entourage is a fancy architecture term for the happy cutout people you put in a render. Uh, the entourage is all white. This is a really common problem, actually, that, you know, your entourage are all very white, conventionally attractive people, uh, can easily alienate your audience. So if you're an architect, consider adding some diversity to your renders. It's a lot easier now than it ever was. Um, but anyway, plans go ahead anyway. Evictions and relocations begin, and the controlled demolition contractors mobilize. Okay, maybe not so controlled. Okay, so we went through the eviction process in the last episode, right? So it was rough and impersonal, involved shuffling people around a lot within the project boundaries until you could convince them to leave. And you could get away with a whole lot of just general abuse if it wasn't too public. Or even if it was public. Here's some evictions being announced by Billboard in St. John, New Brunswick back in 1968. Um, now today the process is a little more orderly 
Residents are given 90 days to vacate and find Section 8 housing elsewhere. If they can't find Section 8 housing, the housing authority will attempt to relocate them to another public housing unit somewhere else in the city. Now, this is not the constant relocation to worse and worse accommodations, which happened in Part 1, but it does have the same net effect of destroying a community. Okay, so does everyone remember the Mikes? This is where Mike lives. He lived on this block his whole life. This is Dad Mike's house. This is Brother Mike's house. The house his other brother Mike rents out at a discount to his friend Mike. Mike's hardware, where Mike's dad Mike owns and where Mike still works. This is in friend Mike's house. And this is his other friend Mike's house. And on the corner here is uh, Mike's confectionaries, which makes such great cannolis. Right, so let's say that after their neighborhood was wrecked by the freeway and their livelihoods ruined, Mike, 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 and Mike all managed to get on the public housing waiting list, and miraculously, they all managed to wind up on the same floor of the same building. So, you know, everyone knows the Mike's floor. They all know each other. Uh, maybe they even run the cannoli place in a tiny improvised retail space on the first floor. And the elevator button for their floor even says M. What does the M stand for? It stands for mezzanine. You thought I was going to say Mike. No, that'd be weird. Uh, so word comes down that the project is being demolished and they have 90 days to find new housing. So Mike and Mike find new apartments in the low rise project just north of the 52nd street project. And then Mike gets a section eight apartment in the neighborhood. In the meantime, Mike gets a section eight apartment, two stops down on the elevated railroad. Uh, Mike, Mike, and Mike aren't so lucky. They make too much to qualify for Section 8 anymore, and uh, public housing is full up in the city. However, with the rash of gentrification, they also can't find apartments in the neighborhood. So Mike, Mike, and Mike have to move to apartment complexes in the suburbs, far from public transportation and farther from their friends and family. You know, Mike, 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 and Mike. And, of course, Mike fares a little better. Uh, he moves in with his new girlfriend, Michelle. So, it's extremely rare, almost unheard of, in fact, for adequate amounts of replacement housing to be built nearby before a project is demolished under Hope 6. Now, usually some kind of right of return is provided to residents of the project. You know, they may return to the neighborhood whenever replacement subsidized units are built, but this may be many years in the future. Uh, whether they exercise this right is an individual choice. You know, moving sucks, and moving twice is even worse. So many folks don't want to move again after a forced displacement. So the communities spread far and wide across the city, and the towers are imploded. Some residents intend to eventually return, but the redevelopment takes time. So, four years and some financial problems later, and the new public-private partnership, mixed income, mixed-use development opens. You know, it looks like any other gentrified block. There's a Starbucks, there's an upscale grocery store, there's a lot of metal panel facades and those four-pane windows that everyone hates. Uh, residents return to the development to see a community which is wealthier and whiter than it was before. This influences many folks' decision not to return. You know, when the cheap corner grocery is now an artisanal cocktail bar and the new upscale coffee shop sells tiny breakfast sandwiches for 11 bucks and the smoke shop has become a pet spa, you know, folks may come to the realization that they can't afford their old neighborhood, even with subsidized rents. The core problem of gentrification, of course, is displacement. Hope six redevelopments displace populations on an industrial scale. So these sorts of Hope six developments usually have two major problems. Number one is they have fewer subsidized units than previously existed on the site. And number two, a lot of times they have fewer units overall than previously existed on the site. I'll give you a real life example instead of, you know, my dramatization. So this is Maverick Landing in East Boston, a mixed-income project funded by Hope Six. 
According to Trinity Financial's website, it's got 396 units and 77% of the units are affordable to households earning up to 60% of area median income, with the remainder being market rate. Uh, Area median income in Boston is something like $85,000 a year, so the threshold for the units to be affordable is that someone making $51,000 a year can afford them. So if you're making above 60% of area median income, you got to go with the market rate apartments, which are going for something like uh, $1,920 a month for a one-bedroom, one-bathroom, according to apartments.com. However, on this site previously were two projects, Maverick Gardens and Clippership, a pair of low-rise public housing projects with 413 units. That's more than 396 units. And furthermore, all of the units were subsidized, not the 304 units which are subsidized in the new mixed income development. That's a total loss of 111 subsidized units under a HOPE 6 redevelopment and a loss of 17 residential units of any kind. Now, were the units in the previous development blighted? Uh, by all accounts, including the residents and the Boston Housing Authority itself, up until it applied for the HOPE 6 grants, no. In 2000, according to an article in the Harvard Law Review, Boston Housing Authority Administrator Sandra Henriquez called Clippership a jewel of public housing. Yet, just two years later, the BHA sought HOPE 6 funds to demolish what they now consider to be the severely distressed Clippership project. The thing was that Clippership and Maverick Gardens sat on prime waterfront property adjacent to the Maverick Tea Station. So, you know, now that Hope 6 was here, it was high time to kick the pores out. And they did in 2006, then tore down the buildings and put up new public-private mixed-income buildings with less housing overall and far less subsidized housing. And there are hundreds of stories like this one across the country, right? According to an article in Dollars and Cents from 2003, by that time, 135,000 public housing units were slated for demolition or had already been demolished, with only 60,000 units slated for revitalization or development. And that obviously means there were less than 60,000 units to replace the demolished ones since some of those were just renovations, they weren't new construction. So this is obviously a problem, right? The bulk of grants to public housing authorities are for tearing down existing public housing and replacing it with many fewer subsidized units and some market rate stuff, often through a public-private partnership. Uh, a lot of the time, it's replaced with fewer units in total uh, than the previous development. I can give a few more examples in my own city of Philadelphia, some more extreme than others. So these are the Hope Six funded Richard Allen Homes in West Poplar, which is north of Center City, Philadelphia. These are reasonably modern, semi-detached suburban homes on large lots, surrounded by much denser development and right next to a four-track express subway, right? What gifts? Okay, so the Richard Allen homes were constructed as a low-rise apartment complex in the 1940s, later supplemented by a pair of towers in the north end of the development. They replaced a dense row house neighborhood and, of course, housed fewer people than the row house neighborhood could. Uh, the row house neighborhood was run down, and, you know, some of the buildings lacked indoor plumbing, but you can renovate stuff, obviously. But instead, that was all torn down and replaced with fewer, more modern units. Now, this complex fell into disrepair by the 1980s, and it was replaced in 2003 by the suburban-style development you see here, housing even fewer people. In fact, it has about half the number of units as the old complex did. Uh, furthermore, it's larger than the old project, so even more row houses were demolished and, again, replaced with fewer units. The frustrating thing is that plenty of people still think this is the way forward, and it is in fact true that the Richard Allen homes are very successful in pretty much every metric except actually housing people. Uh, 
families like their houses. Economic mobility has been pretty high, and lots of residents now own their homes outright. Uh, it's been successful enough in the housing authority's mind that it's been replicated half a dozen times throughout the city, reducing densities and hence the total number of units each time. But uh, in the sense that it can actually house people, it's an unmitigated failure. The waiting lists are long and getting longer, and the reduction in residential units available to anyone uh, is only driving up rents elsewhere in the city. The Richard Allen homes are great if you can get a Richard Allen home. But most of us can't do that. However, in recent years, the Housing Authority has come around to a revolutionary idea. What if they just built new row houses in existing row house neighborhoods? Enter the Sharswood Blumberg Project. Okay, so, so this is a doozy. So the Norman Blumberg apartments were a pair of high-rise towers in the Sharswood neighborhood of Philadelphia, just north of Girard College. They were notoriously underfunded and badly maintained, and by the time planning for replacement was underway, big chunks of the building were falling off the facade and onto the sidewalk. So PHA decided, okay, let's try something different here, and the Sharswood project was born. PHA would not only replace the Blumberg Towers with new low-rise mixed-income housing, but also build additional infill row houses throughout the neighborhood, revitalize the Ridge Avenue commercial corridor, build a new grocery store, and even relocate their headquarters to Ridge Avenue as a form of economic stimulus. So PHA went through the neighborhood to survey which row houses and lots were city-owned, which appeared to be vacant, and so on. Once this data was collected, PHA acquired, through transfer from the city or through eminent domain, 1,300 lots. Most of them were vacant, some had abandoned buildings on them, and of course, some were occupied. So, this project proceeded in the usual fashion for Hope 6. Back in 2016, the Blumberg Towers came down. Today, it's 2019. What's happened since? Well, PHA rehabbed the Senior Citizens Tower, and it's been reoccupied. Some row houses have sprung up around the periphery of the original site of the towers. From street view, these houses look pretty good, but there's a problem. Very little new housing has been built since the towers came down. We're three years in, and the amount of housing in the neighborhood has actually decreased and PHA has allowed what it sees to decay into worse condition, rather than rehab it in a timely fashion. So, for instance, this is the 2400 block of West Oxford Street in 2014. It's an entire block of intact row houses. They were in rough shape and most were abandoned, but most of them were salvageable. And these are really big, you know, grand row houses. You could easily fit two or more modern units into each one. There was also a corner store at 24th Street. Now, two of these guys were missing roofs, and they were total losses, but the rest were largely intact. Two were even occupied. So the authority demolished the two total losses and left the partition walls on the adjacent houses exposed. And partition walls are made with cheaper and softer structural brick rather than weatherproof face brick, right? So... It rained, which compromised these partition walls, so the authority had to demolish the row houses adjacent to the recently demolished ones, and again left those partition walls exposed. And then it rained again, so on and so on. This intact block of row houses is gone today, and will have to be replaced with new construction. And that new construction will be identically sized row houses. Um, and the corner store is now dead, and PHA has left this block in a much worse shape than it was before. This is called demolition by neglect, and it's a fairly common tactic that developers use to get rid of pesky historically protected buildings to put up a new bigger building, right? In this case, however, there was no historic protection and no intention to put up buildings bigger than what was already there or really any reason why PHA ought to have acted as it did. It's just wasteful. 
Now, plenty of surrounding properties were seized by eminent domain for demolition and reconstruction, seemingly with little rhyme or reason. One instance was the North Philly Peace Park, which was a community garden uh, originally located at 24th and Bolton Streets. Now, anyone who lives in a city with a preponderance of vacant land knows that a community garden is like a cartoon pie on a windowsill to developers. The moment they spot one, they float on over, drawn by the sweet smell of vacant land, and bam, your hard-fought tomato plants you and your friends battled the squirrels for all summer are now all gone, and the metal panel cuboid is there in its place with the one bedroom going for $1,100 a month, utilities not included. This project was no exception. There are row houses there now. The North Philly Peace Park has moved two blocks over, and whether it'll move again, who knows. So, part of the reason for the arbitrary exercise of eminent domain was the method of surveying properties. Uh, in this case, windshield surveys. So, uh, you get in a car and you drive around the neighborhood to try and figure out which properties are occupied and which are not. Um, you don't get out of the car for this you just check off a list from your best guess after looking at the building from the car this is not a super accurate survey to say the least and i know because i was an intern at the philadelphia housing authority at that time and i was doing some of those windshield surveys uh sorry about that um this is also partially to preserve secrecy so Big projects like this a lot of the times rely on secrecy to get done on budget. Um, if you reveal, you know, exactly where you want to build or to what extent, you will give the community a chance to organize and you will give developers a chance to snap up properties in the way the bulldozer hoping for a big eminent domain settlement. So you got to cover your tracks. You got to do windshield surveys and try and avoid identifying who you are. We can look at the website for the Sharswood project and see just how much secrecy is involved. There's a tab called Plans and Maps, and there are a whole bunch of plans and maps, and none of these actually show what the project is going to look like or where the new row houses are going. Now, these maps exist. I know because I made some of them, but you damn well will not find them on the site. There's almost a map in one of the old brochures. I, I'm pretty sure I made this one, or at least worked on it. But it's too pixelated to read. So, whatever good was in this project has largely been overshadowed by the general shoddiness of the implementation. Five years into the project, and three years since the bulk of the original public housing was demolished, almost no progress has been made in constructing new public housing units. Uh, it's gotten so bad that protesters are now occupying the new PHA headquarters on the site, which coincidentally was one of the largest parts of the project which has actually been completed. So, Occupy PHA is a protest which is ongoing at the time I'm making this video, and they're demanding, among other things, that PHA immediately commit to building on all 1,300 condemned lots, that PHA end the practice of selling usable public housing into private ownership, that they make every vacant home that PHA owns habitable, they want better accountability for the Housing Authority's Police Department, they want to fire the CEO, because, of course, a public authority has to pretend they're business and have a CEO, and there's a whole bunch of other demands. The link to the full list is in the description, as well as to the Facebook page on the ongoing occupation. Uh, they're accepting donations, of course. Um, now, this is a 24-7 occupation of the PHA headquarters, and so far, all they've been met with from PHA is abuse. And a local contractor tried to run them over with a backhoe. Seriously. So, uh, after hearing all this, it seems like American public housing hasn't had a great track record, right? For folks who back public housing today as a solution to the housing crisis, this ought to be a little disheartening. Folks who describe themselves as FIMBIs for public housing in my backyard, you know, as opposed to YIMBYs or NIMBYs, ought to understand that without massive and rapid investment at the federal level, Public housing on the scale needed to put a dent in, say, the Bay Area's housing prices 
just isn't going to happen. And even if it does, there's no guarantee that the same mistakes of the past, widespread and aggressive condemnations and demolitions, displacement, poor maintenance, and policies that break up families and communities are not repeated. With the current administration in power, of course, even the first step, turning the money faucet on, isn't likely. Uh, you need radical political change at the federal level, and that goes well beyond something like, say, electing Bernie Sanders. Half of our Congress actively wants public housing and other social programs to fail, and the other half is usually ambivalent at best. It's not a great situation for folks hoping the federal government will save us. So what can be accomplished now? There's a few folks, you know, proposing private solutions, of course. So, for instance, both Kanye West and Elon Musk are proposing ideas to make housing more affordable by lowering the cost of construction. Uh, Elon wants to build his car tunnels and provide builders with free bricks from the excavation. Kanye West wants to make a mass-produced, standardized, affordable house through his architecture studio, Yeezy Homes. Both of these strategies, of course, fail to address the core issue with housing affordability. It's not the cost of construction, it's the cost of land that makes housing expensive. There's plenty of affordable homes in America, but they aren't near the jobs. Even if construction were free, it wouldn't bring down the cost of housing too much in the places where it's most needed. It's the land value that's the driver of costs, coupled with exclusionary zoning that makes multifamily construction difficult or impossible. This is why, you know, solutions like, say, tiny houses and so on don't make a lot of sense. A tiny house on a big lot takes about the same amount of urban real estate as a big house on that lot, you know? So I think it's useful to go back and take a look at what was accomplished in another housing crisis under a much more unfriendly government. Uh, late Weimar Germany, you know, uh, when, when the Nazi party was ascendant. So the Nazis, you know, didn't like social housing or many social welfare programs in general, and it conflicted with their whole policy of crushing trade unions and destroying worker power and all that stuff. So those areas of Germany which were not fully controlled by the Nazi party had to make use of alternative power structures to get social housing built. You know, there wasn't going to be a lot of help coming from the Reichstag. So, in this era, it was mainly city governments, but also trade unions, who pooled their resources to fund affordable housing projects. Today, we remember developments like New Frankfurt or the Weisenhof Estate for their radical architecture and their legacy in forming the bones of the international style. However, equally radical was the fact that through alternative power structures, social programs like large-scale public housing could be constructed and operated, even right under the nose of an incredibly hostile government. So today, alternative power structures are still a viable method of getting social housing built, uh, but city governments generally cannot build housing outside of the purview of the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, but um, other structures like a trade union or a community land trust can. Uh, so several community land trusts already operate in the United States. So, for instance, one of my local ones is the Women's Community Revitalization Project. Uh, the WCRP buys land and holds it in perpetuity and develops it into affordable housing, which is also affordable in perpetuity. So this is a power structure which exists outside of government, right? It's a private entity. It may be eligible for low-income housing tax credits uh, and any other local policies to subsidize private affordable housing, but it's not getting the free money from the government the way a public housing authority would. Um, as a private entity, it could be more flexible than a public housing authority, so it can use land for community gardens or commercial mixed-use developments or what have you. Um, as private entities, they may or may not be especially accountable to the actual community. Uh, furthermore, community land trusts must operate within the capitalist framework. While they're called non-profit, they still need to turn a profit or break even, or they'll go bankrupt and be dissolved by creditors for failing to make debt obligations, or by the city for failing to pay property taxes. 
So this is not a perfect solution, but it's what we got. Um, and our other option, of course, is trade union funded housing. And in the past, unions have done some really great work here. Some very large projects have been funded through trade unions, like Co-op City in the Bronx, funded by the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America. So one problem here is that for a very long time, the government has sought to limit the ability of labor organizations to control capital, namely by limiting their control over their largest supply of capital, pension funds. So, the 1947 Taft-Hartley Act famously outlawed many kinds of strikes and labor actions. It also outlawed exclusive union control of pension plans, with some existing union-controlled plans grandfathered in, and it required a 50-50 split between the employees and the employer uh, in representation in the boards of trustees of new pension funds. This was ostensibly to prevent unions from using pension funds as a war chest during strikes. So, for instance, previously if the union went on strike, the union-controlled pension fund could then pay out to all active union members, rather than just retirees, to allow strikes to happen with less economic risk for workers. Uh, Taft-Hartley effectively outlawed this by appointing employers to the board of trustees. But in practice, this went much further. Uh, this gave employers leverage over how unions used their largest reserves of capital and curtailed many efforts to increase worker control of industry or otherwise invest pension funds into efforts which fav favored the labor movement. Now, your multi-employer unions had more influence over the use of pension funds since the union was a solid voting block while the multiple employers appointed individual board members, you know, as exemplified by the ACWA's ability to use their pension fund to finance Co-op City in 1973. So, later on, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act was passed in 1974. This further reduced control of how unions manage their pension funds and to use their capital towards socially beneficial ends. So, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA, introduced a requirement for something called fiduciary duty, right? W w what does this mean? So, basically, the pension fund is obligated to get the best possible returns for its beneficiaries, uh, who are the folks drawing the pension, uh, the retirees. So, this sounds great, right? But in practice, it can limit some options for investing. Okay, so let me give you an example here. Assume I'm the manager or the fiduciary of a pension fund appointed by the board of trustees and I have a couple of options for investing a big sum of money. So option A is social housing for workers in the union who are or will be beneficiaries of the pension. This provides very real material benefits for union members and pensioners in the form of lower rents, better housing, and so on, but it doesn't return the fund a lot of money. It has a low ROI or return on investment. Now, option B is to invest in the company where my union workers work, which increases worker control, maybe gets the workers a seat on the board, and provides modest returns to the pension fund over time. It has a medium return on investment, right? Now, option C is to invest in a new Silicon Valley app that lets people, I don't know, send dick pics to each other. Now, this app has proved wildly popular and has provided consistently high returns for investors. It is a very high return on investment, so assume for the purposes of this example, somehow the risk in all of these investments is about even, right? So, to start, your pension fund board is half controlled by the employer because of Taft-Hartley, and thus the fiduciary is probably fairly conservative, so option B is considered a conflict of interest and is thrown out entirely. 
is not universal, of course. In multi-employer pension funds, the union has the largest voting bloc, so, for instance, the United Auto Workers was able to buy enough of General Motors to appoint a member to the board of directors. Um, this was through their retiree health care trust, not the pension, and eventually they were forced to sell and the board member stepped down in late 2018. So, with option B eliminated, that leaves us with the low return on investment social housing to invest in, or the high return on investment dick pick app. In this case, fiduciary duty tends to require the fiduciary to invest in the dick pick app. Okay, so this is an extreme example, of course, just to get the gist of it across. In practice, unions can agitate for the fiduciary to make pro-union investments if they have near equal returns to alternative anti-union or union agnostic investments. This tends to prevent investments in things like affordable social housing, since, you know, you could instead put up luxury housing, which is, of course, identical to affordable housing except for the rent, uh, and you could make more money that way. A couple of this with the fact that half the board of directors of the fund is appointed by the employer due to Taft Hardly, and the fact that union leadership as a whole is much less radical than they've been in the past, and social investments become very difficult indeed. Now, I am not a lawyer, but as I understand it, the jury is out on whether fiduciary duty is an actually a real barrier to social investments. It's never really been tested in court. Um... Now, in places where Taft hardly doesn't exist and unions can have full control of their funds, social investments are easier. So, for instance, in Quebec, there is the Fonds de Solidarité, uh, which is a large investment fund controlled by the Federation des Travelers et Travelers de, de Quebec, uh, the Quebec Federation of Labor in English. Uh, this fund invests in businesses, infrastructure, real estate, so on and so forth, and then tries to influence them towards more pro-labor decisions. I'm not sure if they own low-income housing, but it's definitely not outside the range of possibility. Now, the Solidarity Fund isn't a pension fund, but it certainly supports Quebecois workers. Now, under the strictest interpretation of fiduciary duty, a pension fund cannot behave like the Quebec Solidarity Fund. It would have to make decisions solely in the interest of increasing the value of the fund and ensuring the sustainability of pension payouts, rather than any socially valuable investments like workforce housing, which have lower monetary returns. Um, the law enforces the nastiest and most short-sighted form of capitalism, and nothing short of a full-on revolt against not only Ariza, but the Taft-Hartley Act and conservative union leadership is going to change that. And the influence of union-controlled pension funds is coupled with the fact that, as a whole, in the United States, we've moved away from fixed-benefit pensions into tax-advantaged retirement investing vehicles like 401ks and IRAs. Um, not only does this weaken pension funds by making them a smaller part of the economy, this has the effect of atomizing your retirement investing, right? So your only option to benefit yourself in the long run is to try for the highest returns from your investments. Under this scheme, there's no, like, realistic class solidarity action which is going to get, say, Vanguard Group to do something socially responsible with its index funds. And, of course, if they did, they wouldn't be index funds anymore. So, uh, where does that leave us? Well, we're kind of between a rock and a hard place, to be honest. Uh, with regard to social housing, the federal government is asleep at the wheel, and labor unions are effectively barred from mobilizing capital to make socially useful investments. Community land trusts usually don't have the economic power to build housing at large enough of a scale to make a difference. Uh, so, for instance, recently Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez opened a new 67-unit affordable senior housing project in Queens, built by a non-profit. It looks good, and it's very green with its passive house construction. In a city whose public and low-income housing waiting list is 209,000 households long, it's not even a drop in the bucket.
the thing is, it's hard to say where we go from here with regard to public housing. Housing prices are an immediate problem, and public housing is a solution that takes a long time and a lot of political will to implement. Right now, our largest programs are entirely concerned with subsidizing landlords and privatizing existing public housing. Real anti-market public housing that brings down the cost of rent will require nothing short of tearing down the Department of Housing and Urban Development and rebuilding it from scratch to achieve new aims. You know, cheap, high-quality housing for everyone. So, in the meantime, what should we be organizing around? Well, obviously you want to organize around policies that mitigate or otherwise help with issues that public housing is meant to address, namely rents and quantity and quality of housing units. So, our short-term solutions are achieved through organizations like tenants' unions, uh, which can agitate for policies that help us out now. You know, universal rent control, just cause eviction laws, and other tenant-friendly policies which can stem the tide of rising rents. Uh, in the medium term, policy changes like altering zoning codes to eliminate apartment bans, parking minimums, and other inefficient land use requirements can help bring down the cost of new construction and increase the supply of private housing. Uh, policies like inclusionary zoning can create new affordable housing in previously unaffordable neighborhoods. And obviously you have to be careful here, right? Uh, liberalized land use policies without strong tenant protections can easily exacerbate problems associated with gentrification and displacement, right? This is a, this is a both and situation, not either or. You gotta do both tenant protections and altering zoning codes. But uh, in cities which are adding hundreds of thousands of jobs but only hundreds of housing units, new construction is essential. We'll talk more about this in an episode which focuses more on zoning and private housing. Oh, and of course, abolition of work also has the potential to help us out a lot here, but that's a much longer term policy goal. So in the long term, there needs to be massive changes in federal policy, including universal public housing available to people of all incomes and an aggressive construction and property acquisition schedule. It may not look like traditional public housing. It may even just be existing housing stock repurposed for the public good. It may be new row houses or new small apartment buildings. It may be tower blocks if you really want that kind of thing. But it has to go beyond the traditional model of public housing towers for the poor, suburban single-family homes for the middle class and rich. You know, reforming and densifying urban and suburban land use to reduce carbon emissions is crucial to stopping climate change, and public housing can help us get there. So it's probably about time to go take another hard look at the Red Vienna model. Fundamentally, public housing is an anti-market intervention which can artificially lower rents and increase the housing supply far past what the market can provide. This is effectively what the uh, Social Housing in the United States paper from People's Policy Project uh, proposes. So if you want a detailed policy proposal, I'd recommend starting there. Uh, that link's in the description. But uh, in short, Public and social housing needs to be built out rapidly uh, without displacing existing housing. Public housing ought to be open to all people with rent based entirely on ability to pay, or maybe we can do away with rents altogether. Um, public housing ought not to impose onerous rules and regulations on its residents. You know, if we thought of public housing in this way, uh, public housing would be more efficient, better run, and more available to more people and everyone would benefit. They accept the landlords, I guess. Okay, so that was the episode. Here's the commercial. So, this was a long video, hence why it took, you know, a long time to make. If you want to complain a bunch about that, then, you know, feel free to leave a comment. I'll even post it to Twitter so you can have your voice amplified. Uh, I think the next episode of Franklin's going to be much shorter, so it may even come out this month. Uh, if you enjoy the show, consider supporting me on the Patreon for a dollar a month. That gets you in the credits and also gets you a bonus episode about Killdozer. At some point, there will be more than one bonus episode. 
probably not until next month at the absolute earliest. Uh, if you don't want to support monthly, there's a buy me a coffee link in the description where you can make a one-time donation. That doesn't get you a bonus episode, and also it's more expensive than supporting me on Patreon for three months, so, you know, those are your options. Uh, if you prefer, you can try and pirate the bonus episode, but if your time's worth 15 bucks an hour, and you spend more than four minutes trying to find a link to the bonus episode, you're getting ripped off and should just give me the dollar. Uh, the link to the Patreon, again, is in the description. Now, thanks to your support, I'm able to pay your my landlord, but also not run ads on this channel, right? That's why Dennis Prager wasn't talking to you before the uh, video started. Um, so if you want more content and hot takes, please follow me on the Twitter at DoNotEat1. Okay, uh, uh, onto the credits. <laughs>